This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. Thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. You're listening to episode 154. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. So I'd like to start off by uh, wishing you and, and hoping you all had a great holiday weekend. A little peek into the craft household. Uh, I was able to get a surf in. Uh, we got our once a year Chinese food fix. Uh, we watched Wonder Woman 2 and worked, you know, mostly because uh, we are one week away from the SNN Network Canada virtual event happening on January 6 and 7, 2021. The agenda is now available and the booking period for one-on-one -on -one meetings with presenting companies is now open. I say this humbly. I truly, truly mean this. I, I wouldn't say this unless I thought it was true. This is one of the best lineups that we've ever assembled. Presenting companies, speakers, agenda, everything. It's I'm, I'm just beyond excited for this event and for you all to, to take part in it. So now's the time to go and uh, register on Canada.SNN.network. Click the register button, go fill out your agenda, make some requests with some, with some companies if you'd like. You know, uh, we're, we're really excited for what we have to bring to you and uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Now, for this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Elliot Turner. He is the managing partner and CIO of RGA Investment Advisors. Uh, I've been following Elliot on Twitter for a long time, and I, and I finally worked up the courage uh, to ask him to be on and, and be a guest here. Uh, in fact, actually, literally right before we did our interview, uh, Toby Carlisle published his interview with Elliot, and it was fantastic. So it got me even more stoked uh, to have him on the show here today. So um, Elliot is also currently a, a co-host on MOI Global's uh, This Week in Intelligent Investing podcast. It's a great show that I highly recommend where he shares his insights and investing theses on a pretty regular basis. So for today's episode, kind of similar to what we did with Bill Brewster and uh, Jake Taylor and, and a few others that uh, now have podcasts or are frequently on podcast shows, is that we really just focused on chatting about things that we find interesting. So uh, for this one, it's streaming wars and sports betting, and really most importantly, New York sports. Uh, we happen to represent opposite sides of the New York sports fan spectrum and support each other through this very difficult time as a New York sports fan. But in all seriousness, I had a great time. And please, I hope you enjoy uh, Elliot's in-depth look at both Roku and Camby. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 154 of the Planet Microcap podcast. And please enjoy my interview with Elliot Turner. Welcome back, everybody, to the Planet Microcap podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. You can follow me on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And I have a very special guest today. You actually, you probably just heard an episode that he did uh, on one of our uh, one of our favorite shows, uh, the Acquirers podcast with Tobias Carlisle. But, you know, he's been very generous with his time and he's I, he's making the rounds right now. I, I love it. You know, it's to our benefit, to everybody's benefit. But uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Elliot Turner, the managing partner and CIO at RGA Investment Advisors. Elliot, great to have you on, man. How you doing? 
Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Bobby. Doing well. Definitely got a little more to say than, you know, just tying my identity to Twitter and PayPal. So happy (laughs) to explore a little more territory. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I invite everybody to go check out that, that, that pod because he literally just, I think the final half hour was literally just his total dissection of Twitter and PayPal. And it's, it's a really good episode. And I, I, I just listened to it yesterday. I, I, I very much, as, and, and as, as admitted now that people can see on Twitter on the actual platform, I said, I, I have to listen to all these shows at two X, man. It's just, there's, there's so many good shows out there now, you know, it's, it's so hard, right? One and a half to two X. I use Otter AI to transcribe some and read it <laughs> because there's so much great content and there's certain, you know, podcasts I definitely don't want to miss. Yeah, that's for sure. All right. We, the, the first thing that we really need to hit here, and this is really something that's very important to me. I know it's very important to you. And I just wanted to express my condolences on being the other half of the New York <laughs> sports fandom. I mean, <laughs> dude, like I, 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 I pain for you, you know, it's just, it's I, what, what, how, how did we get here? Okay. I mean, how did we get to, so for those who don't know, there's two sides, there's Mets, Jets, Islanders, Yankees. Well, I throw Knicks in there too. I mean, I guess you mm-hmm. can't really throw the Nets, but you know, I got Yankees, Giants, Rangers, and then Knicks too. But I mean, maybe we overlap there. I'm not totally sure, but what, how, how did we get here, man? And, and how can we help support you through this difficult, difficult time? Well, they're all difficult times. So, um, <laughs> and thank you for acknowledging that there's this like underbelly of the New York sports world. Like when people have this conversation about which, which city, is the worst sports city to be a fan in, you know, you hear Cleveland and obviously they've got some basketball championships under their belt now. And you hear like, you know, Detroit for a while was thrown in there, but they've done well in hockey. Um, And, you know, whatever else it may be like, there's this underbelly to New York where it's even worse being just terrible in New York where other teams experience success. One of my saddest days as a child, you know, and I'm lucky to be able to say this was when the Rangers won the cup in 94 I was devastated. Um, it was really hard, you know, like saying 1940 was a point of pride. What, for the Islanders, what? You guys had four titles back, when was it? That was the late, was that the late 70s, early 80s? Early 80s, yeah. Early 80s, I was right. uh, I, I, I was born when championship number three was was uh, being won. Um, you know, so, so I was alive for two Islanders championships. I was alive for one Mets championship in 86. I definitely don't remember it. There's a picture of me wearing a 1986 Mets World Championship shirt with Big Bird in uh, Sesame Street. So I could like maybe think that I was a fan during all that, but I don't remember anything. You know what? There was a, it was, and I'm going to quote the Bill Simmons uh, uh, podcast on here. There was almost a, a classic Ewing theory, though, with John Tavares getting, signing with the Maple Leafs. I mean, the Islanders went farther. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that, that must have felt a little good. Yeah. And, you know, I right away, I kind of felt okay about JT leaving. I I was a little hurt because the year before we named our daughter Jillian and her initials were JT. And I was super excited to get a a JT (laughs) Islander shirt for her. Um, You know, so that was the hardest part of it for me. But like Matty Barzal is one of the best players I've ever seen. One of the most dynamic players that I've got to watch as a fan. I, I don't recall the Islanders. Like we've had some superstars and some really good goal scorers. But the kind of player who could dominate the puck and could tilt the ice like that is something that, I mean, Claude Lapointe was the closest we had. And I don't know if anyone out there will remember Claude Lapointe. Um, He was on the Nordiques with Sackick before they moved to Colorado and then came to the Islanders. The guy had wheels, but he had hands of steel. Like he could not score a goal if his life depended on it. Um, you, know, you can give him two breakaways a game and, and end up with nothing out of that. Um, I think I think the only people that remember the Nordiques are anybody that was that had played NHL '95, and me <laughs> yep. being obsessed with that being that my first like Super Nintendo game. I know I, that's the only way I know the Nordiques and uh, who's it? The Whalers? Yeah, the Whalers. Yeah, that, well, I'm in Connecticut, so the Whaler a big deal here, even still. Oh wow, they need to, that. They they should bring that team back. I mean, come on. There's def there's definitely still interest in in hockey in Connecticut for sure. Big time. Connecticut's huge with hockey. I kind of didn't even realize till I moved. To, you know, I grew up in, in on Long Island in New York. Uh, now I live in Connecticut, and it's like the amount of rinks that we have in Stamford is more than you'd have in like you know several towns consecutive on Long Island. Um, hockey's big time here, and you know I I, I love it. It's great. Um, mm-hmm. I miss my adult hockey league the last game I played I think it was like 
uh, March 7th was the night that the futures opened minus 8%. Mm -hmm. And I had this feeling in my heart that this might be my last chance to play for a long time. And I think it was the best game I played since I was a little kid. And, you know, just came out there flying. And no one else on my team believed me before we took the ice that this might be our last game for a long time. And I think that really, like, kind of motivated me in a different way. How many goals did you score that night? I scored two goals playing defense. So, you know, and, and, and we won pretty big. Um, it, fe- it felt really good. Um, I-, I hope you don't take offense, but you're like a Brian Leach. <laughs> Um, you know, that was a deep, Brian deep Leach cut was, Rangers. That was a deep cut Rangers joke for anybody. No, but by it. the way, I was a huge fan of Brian Leach growing up for so many reasons. He he was one of the great American hockey players, right? I got Paolo Fontaine's jersey up here. Those two, I think, kind of defined a generation of American hockey. Maybe you could add Mike Madonna in there. I don't. Sorry, yeah. Brett Hull. I mean, you're kind of American, <laughs> kind of not. Um, but like Brian Leach and Paolo Fontaine really like, I owe a lot of credit to, to me being a hockey fan to those guys. They're, they're like really good people and great players. And, yeah. uh, all right. So before, and so my last uh, sports question then is, you know, how excited are you to also see Lafreniere? All right. Like that's going to be sick. Mm-hmm, <laughs> that front line, Lafreniere, we got Panarin. I mean, uh, uh, I can't say his name correctly, but Zip, Zip, Bin, I think that's how he's on. Yeah. But, Zibinijad, uh, yeah. Zibinijad, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Excited for you guys. The rivalry is going to be really nice. It's going to be nice having these new modified divisions where like, you know, the Isles and Rangers are really going to bang heads way more times than in normal years. We'll see if the NHL sticks with that. Super excited. Really excited for the Islanders. We got to get Matty Barzal signed and then I could sleep a little better at night. Um, you know, it's the kind of thing where you know it's going to happen, but like until it actually happens, we've been burnt so many times, like kind of expect the worst. And I think that's helped me as an investor, right? I've been taught to expect the worst, set the bar low, low expectations. It builds character, um, you know, all these, all these fun things. For everyone listening, that is what we call a perfect segue. That's that is like that's like that's like a that's like a perfect pass right over the blue line just <laughs> before the guy before the guy passes. For, you know, so it's not an offsides. But anyways, great segue. Let's get it. Let's get into it a little bit. You know, um, okay. On on in in the episode that you just did with Toby, you talk a little bit about your background. You know, you, on there you mentioned that you know, you went to law school and that you wanted to be a sports agent. I think, I think it was in between years at law school. So, you know, tell us a little bit more than about, you know, where your passion for investing began. Did it start even before you went down that path or was it while you were there and, and starting to realize, you know, our wonderful world of finance here? Sure. Yeah. So I was really lucky as a fourth grader, my teacher, Mrs. Burdick, like she was the teacher everyone hoped to have in school. Um, she enrolled every kid in the Newsday stock market game. And she had actually given uh, us all the Berkshire uh, annual report, introduced us to who uh, Warren Buffett is. And, um, you know, obviously she introduced us to who Buffett is, but everyone ended up as a dart thrower trying to find the next hot thing that we could win the competition with. Um, I, you know, don't even remember exactly which stocks I was attracted to at the time. I know my family had this company, Symbol Technologies, that like when I was a child, my dad put a little play money in. Um, Symbol Technologies, interestingly, is in financial shenanigans, identified as the only company that identifies that that checks every box for um, the kinds of fraud they committed. So it ended up being pretty bad uh, during the dot com era. Um, but you know, Mrs. Burdick really like got me interested in the stock market, got me thinking about stocks. Um, you know, not very robust thoughts. Um, the next thing that happened was I, I had kept that interest when I was bar mitzvahed, uh, as a 13 year old, I was in seventh grade and I had a little money that my parents, you know, because I had this passion about the stock market and would talk about it, uh, kind of like adults would in a weird way. Um, they let me, uh, make a couple investments. Um, at the time we had just gotten our first computer not long before. So I put, uh, my money into Microsoft and Intel. I really wanted to buy Dell, but my dad said, no, um, I still need to dig at him for the reasons why, because as nice as Microsoft and Intel were, Dell would have been even better at that time. Um, so, you know, big mistake. Um, and you know, what ended up happening is, Okay, so Peter Lynch style, like buy what you know, 
um, turned into these great successes that I was like, okay, I'm going to sell these and throw darts at like high flying internet companies. So ended up with like Safeway Scientific and then ICGE, which spun off from it, which is one of the most epic charts. Um, I, I'm not sure, like 99.99% down from where it was. They had to change their name. I, I don't even remember what it is these days. Um, but my family got really swept up in the dot com bubble. And like, you know, I was really passionate about stocks through it all. I didn't really have a process. I didn't really have thoughts. I didn't have a mentor who I like attached to and was teaching me like this is the right way to invest and all that. Um, but you know, I, I, I really liked the idea of investing. I like trying to identify companies and quality. Um, I didn't have a framework for thinking about valuation. And when everything crumbled down and I saw like exactly, you know, the other side of uh, the bubble, um, I, I realized like, you know, I love this stuff, but I need a framework. And so, you know, really circuitous path that ended up uh, getting me back into the market. But one thing I knew all along, I always knew that like, no matter what I did in life, I'd wanna like take control of my own investments. I'd wanna be involved in doing my own investments. Um, you know, when I first had paychecks, I put money into an Ameritrade account and I was like trying to you know, find the right way to invest and trying to learn. So. That, that, that's a background to it. It's something that's like that stuck with me from a young age. I, I think I was lucky to have had that introduction. Dude, one of my biggest regrets is like the, what you did is that after my bar mitzvah, I didn't do anything with my bar mitzvah. I just I think I went and bought a drum set or something like that. Or, or pretty that, awesome. I mean, pretty awesome. Very much <laughs> enjoyed it. You know, I think I got a couple more symbols and everything. But I think maybe a, an Apple investment at the time would have been pretty nice too. Uh, you know, I feel like that's like the same hindsight game I always play. Like on a day, especially when I have conversation. I'm like, oh man, if I only yep. took my bar mitzvah money in two thousand one and just just let it sit. You know, but but at the same time, I probably would have done another mistake because that's it's just like you. There was no framework. It's just like, all right, I'm gonna throw a dart at something I know. Exactly. Yeah, it's, but it's, it's better to happens. learn these lessons when you're young. It's better to learn these lessons True. like with small uh, amounts at stake. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I will facetiously call it one of the better things that happened to me is when my parents divorce started. Um, I was forced to sell every stock I had and it was put aside into an account. I went to college. And if I hadn't sold these things, I started college. Um, I was the class of 2000. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it couldn't have timed the exit from the bubble more perfectly, except right. I wouldn't have timed it perfectly. I was devastated that I had to sell my stocks, but it was like, you know, really one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me in that sense. Um, could have ended up with a whole lot of debt and instead, you know, college was paid for out of this fluky, like really uh, lucky sequence of events. It was like one one fortuitous moment of stock market adventure after another. Um, and I think having internalized that has made me far more disciplined, far more patient. Um, and it's ingrained certain like behavioral traits in me as I approach the market. Um, you know, I've seen, uh, you, you know, while I was lucky to have my stuff sold, my parents' accounts were frozen and they wrote everything to zero. And it's like, that was everything they had saved and built up for years. And, you know, I, I got to see, you know, the worst side of things. And it's made me like way more protective of what I am able to, you know, kind of generate return wise in the market and way more um, conscious of like that there is, you know, these things aren't easy. It's really hard. Um, yeah. It's not a given right that gains stay gains. Um, and so you have to be really thoughtful and you have to evolve, right? The entire environment changes many times over. Um, so this adaptability, some, some, uh, some process where you kind of internalize situational awareness and understand what's going on around you. Um, you can't just be like, I like this company. It's qualitatively awesome. I'm going to hold it forever, right? You have to be thoughtful. You have to have a framework. Like, what's it worth? What's it really worth? And can you justify it? Um, so I think, you know, even while I've had some successes in some of these technology names, like I'm, I'm very unforgiving on valuation when I establish positions. Um, so, and I don't know if I would have gotten to be there had it not been from some of those earlier years. And as we're talking now, you know, I mean, I'd say there are some distinct signs of froth in the market. There are some areas where there's some behavior that's more akin to, 1999 than to what we've experienced in the last 20 years. And so, you know, I think being able to kind of like sit back and say like these pockets are areas that I just don't want to play a part in at all. And I can totally 
be comfortable not playing ball in these places, um, I think it helps me. Like I don't have to experience FOMO. Let, let, that, this, that's a good, that's a good, I want to go down that tangent. You know, I was going to, we're going to come back to that later, but screw it. Let's do it right now. I mean, you know, cause it, it, especially you were talking about in your pod yesterday that I heard yesterday that you did with Toby, you were talking about how, you know, your, your strategy is very low turnover. Um, mm-hmm. And, and something that's been covered on here quite a bit, especially of late and thinking about the frothiness of the market. And especially, you know, we're seeing interest rates that are probably going to stay low for a long time, you know, so there's no reason to think, you know, unless you're, you know, Nostradamus and you have an idea of what the next black swan events going to be, you know, or, you know, none of us knew that it was going to be a you know pandemic like it was back in March, you know, you're now starting to really, uh, you're, it's, it's forcing investors that may have had lo- like, a you know, not, not so long term as like the five to 10 years that may have been thinking more in the short term of like two to three years, forcing them to think, all right, let me think more five to 10 years, you know, with some of the businesses right now. I mean, so how have you been thinking about, you know, when you're assessing a new investment currently in this market? Yeah. So that's a dangerous place to be when you're like extending your duration to justify where things are, Um, where the environment is acting on you as an investor, as opposed to the other way around where you're an investor acting, you know, in search for just good businesses at the right prices. Right. Um, so it's really important to try to like, make sure that the environment doesn't exert pressures on you. Um, that said, I, I mean, while I, while I see these signs of froth, I still feel like I'm finding very interesting opportunities. Um, more recently, I've found some of the more exciting stocks that I've been involved in, um, or hope, hopefully, um, and maybe exciting is the wrong word. I kind of regret having said exciting. Um, I mean that in the sense that like, I think there are outstanding risk rewards to be found. Um, but I don't necessarily think they're in the most obvious of places. Um, and I think, you know, you really have to, um, just turn over a lot of rocks to try to find them. Um, one of the things that starts happening though, is like, so I'm a GARP investor. I, I am like, call it like completely determined to buy companies that are uh, that I could substantiate on valuation terms and that have a degree of growth. And so, you know, where I fall on the, on the spectrum there, I mean, I can move to the growthier side of things and I can move to the more value side of things. And I'm somewhat fluid in that. It really comes back to qualitatively how I could determine the quality of the business. Um, but you know, what happens is you buy companies as GARP and sometimes they turn into growth. Right. Mm -hmm, Right. And so that's where I think it gets a little trickier. So you end up in a position that you started as GARP and it's distinctly no longer GARP. Right. Um, and it ends up like pretty expensive based on where you'd start with. And so, you know, the hard part to reconcile there is I think for a GARP investor, your best returns ever will be when you buy something GARP and it turns into growth and it stays that way for a long time. So you don't want to like hit out too soon and and leave the position. But at the same time, some of the uh, more frustrating experiences could happen where, you know, you start at GARP, something turns into growth and well, you know, it doesn't really uh, hang on to the growth and it goes all the way back to where you started from. That's an experience I had in Grubhub and it was quite frustrating. And it's like, why'd I, you know, kind of take this full circle in this thing from my starting point all the way to glory, all the way back, uh, you know, back down to uh, kind of something not too substantial in the end. Um, And, you know, it's really hard and I think it's tough, but I think, you know, one of the things for me is really seeing ideas through. If I really have a good idea and I really could qualitatively understand where things are going, I'm a little more forgiving on the valuation after I've already established it And it's got, you know, a nice uh, starting point relative to where it is. And, you know, I do think like what one of the things that I and my investors have to be comfortable with is the way if it really is quality, the way it will digest those returns is by stagnating for a few years. It's not going to digest those returns by absolutely collapsing. It's going to go sideways. It's going to consolidate. It's going to establish a new higher plateau that it could launch off from. And so, you know, those are situations where I am comfortable um, dealing with like a really choppy period after a nice run up. And, you know, I, I think there are a couple of things that I'm sitting in right now that I might, you know, from here might not get any return for a couple of years, but like, I really like the business. Um, I could say like, you know, for right now it's a little stretch, but in five years, you know, I still really, really do feel like they have more to achieve. All right. So, I mean, this actually goes back to a question that I was, uh, on a, a similar tangent, but you know, we're, 
going, we're going many, many tangents. We'll, we'll get there. Don't worry. You, you'll hear my point. Um, yeah. Is is I mean, is this a framework that you established? What I mean, it sounds like you established this well ahead of you know the craziness that we've kind of experienced here in 2020. So you kind of had that discipline going in. So can you describe a little bit more of this investing framework that you put together? You know, kind of catch us up from you know college to 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 now. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So coming out of college, I went to law school. Um, Law school was a good way to kind of punt on making an actual decision about what I wanted to do, though I had a vision of where I wanted to end up. Um, Like through law school, I was really intent. We started with sports, right? I'm really passionate about sports. I love, uh, you know, several different sports at the time when I was graduating college, uh, football was the one I wanted to, you know, be I, I, I had a good path to, to working in the agent side of football, but I inevitably wanted to work on the team side. Um, I think in football, the team side of things is somewhat similar to investing where, you know, the team side, meaning like the salary cap department or position yeah. with the team. Um, you have this puzzle. Uh, you have confines of, you know, where the salary cap is and you have all these pieces that you want to fit into it. And it's a little bit of a combination of, you know, doing qualitative analysis of which players could get me to where I want to be, but quantitative analysis, like how could I create these creative structures that get me within the salary cap while not sacrificing my future? And there are all these trade-offs that you have to consider and it's fun and it's interesting. Um, And, you know, I think, I I think that kind of is very much uh, similar to investing, like the framework that you have to take when you approach it uh, is similar to the investing framework. Um, I ended up in my first uh, trading role, I ended up on a trading desk, actually. Um, And the trading desk was day trading. And it was like, you know, I mean, they call it prop trading, but I think that's maybe trying to glorify something that's not necessarily all that, uh, I don't know, interesting, for lack of a better word. Um, It never fit my personality, but I had great bosses who are very willing to let me explore what worked for me. Um, And one of the important lessons that I took out of that, they were very insistent that there's no one right answer to make money in the market. Uh, The right answer to make money has to fit your personality. And there are people of all different, um, all all different personalities coming at it from all different angles, you could be incredibly successful. And that's part of the beauty of the market, right? There's no one true right answer. And that's actually one of my biggest gripes with like, you know, when you talk about value investors and the value school of things, like I do think there's this hubris, like, we know the one true way and the way we make money is more pious than any other. And, you know, maybe I, I, I don't know, I don't know the right answer, but I, you know, I do know that what fit my personality was this idea of, okay, so, well, I came from a day trading shop where you're like hitting keyboards like a monkey. I actually really like sitting with things for a very long time right? I'm still an Islanders, Mets, and Jets fan. I haven't given up on these teams as bad as it's gotten. Not to say I wouldn't give up on a bad idea in the market, um, but I do believe in, you know, seeing ideas through the end, right? So I I wanted a long-term investment strategy. I got to start experimenting with that, you know, both myself and I was given risk capital at my firm. Um, And I wanted to, um, you know, what, what I ended up for me that really worked for me. So GARP, right? I'm unrelenting on uh, needing growth and needing valuation. But I also want the companies to have quality. Like quality to me means several different things. Um, so, you know, in the quantitative sense, quality means that there's high returns on invested capital, right? But also in in a qualitative sense, quality to me means the company takes care of all their stakeholders. And, you know, I've made some mistakes along the way, not approaching this in the right way. But, you know, to me, a, a quality company makes their suppliers happy, not just it makes their customers happy, uh, makes their employees happy. It takes care of everyone along the way. And it's, you know, to me, that's quality. And I'm unrelenting on quality, right? That's something that I really want in all my companies. Um, and one of the other things that I really look for that I pay a lot of attention to, um, you know, I, I mentioned before this idea that I want to buy a company when it's uh, GARP, but hold it when it's growth. I want some kind of optionality in a company. I want something where if a few things go right, the uh, opportunity is going to be way better than how I originally sized it up. And I want that optionality to come to me, you know, essentially free. I want it to be way underpriced. I want people to not appreciate the optionality um, in the same way that I can. And oftentimes that involves a company who has built some sort of platform and a platform in a way where like, it's not just about having one product that they could sell with unit economics, 
but it's about having a relationship with all their key stakeholders in a way that they could start pushing in different directions, adding ancillary products, both verticals and horizontals, and really extending the duration of the runway that they could invest against. Yeah, no, I, I, we were talking offline about, you know, because, you know, on, on Toby's show, you're talking about, you know, Twitter and, and PayPal, and we were talking a little bit about Roku. Um, and, I mean, it, just to, I mean, is that an example of something that I, I think you're, you're a shareholder of Roku, right? I am. Yeah. So, I mean, is Roku an example of that thought process and that, that framework? Absolutely. And, you know, Roku is the only stock I ever tried to buy in an IPO until now. I try to, my broker doesn't love me enough to give me shares of like DoorDash or Airbnb. I'm low turnover. <laughs> I don't trade enough. I'm not an important relationship at all. Um, Roku, I try to buy. I didn't get any shares. You know, I was really intrigued with that company beforehand. And it gets to one other factor that I really look for this idea of um, change, right? Uh, what was the change at Roku? So when I started with Roku, um, you know, really when I first tried to buy shares, they were more a hardware company than a platform company. And I say that only in the sense that their revenue pool came more from hardware than it did from the platform side of things. I, I, I remember when they, it was, they, they were, that, that, that was on the market trying to compete with the Apple TVs. And you always mm -hmm. just went with the Apple TV at the time because you're like, all right, I mean, my Apple TV. I bought like, the first what... Apple TV at the time too. Dang. I bought the first yeah. Roku. I was involved, you know, I, I, I definitely, you know, was keen on watching the products in the space. And yeah, everyone thought of Roku as just, you know, I, I mean, actually the term that, that I'd heard in the industry is dummy pucks and sticks, right? <laughs> it's either a little pancake that you put uh, or a stick that you put in your TV that gives you a little yeah. extra something special. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, never in my wildest dreams when I started with Roku, I mean, the, literally the day I bought shares in uh, uh, November, December of 2018, when I started my position, I didn't have a single day that the stock was up um, for, for at least half a month. I think it was like 15 days straight in the market. The stock actually went down from when I put my first cash into the stock. And, um, you know, I was down 30% before I saw a single up day in the stock. It was like, oh my God, what did I get myself into here? You know, I mean, Roku today looks glorious, but it was not easy. It was actually one where, you know, at the time a client's like, why are you buying this like hardware company? I've grant, you know, thankfully built a whole lot of trust with my clients where, you know, they merely ask the question. They don't say like, get out of here. Um, but, you know, it was really tough. It was, it was not necessarily that easy, but at the time, you know, I did say to myself like, well, this company is really well positioned. They have a really good asset. I fundamentally believe that there is a future where everything we watch is through connected to connected TV, that there will not be this distinction between CTV and TV. Like TV is just all going to be connected. Like why the hell not? And one of the other things that I really thought was important at the time, um, a lot of people had this belief that, okay, well, you know, now in the living room, I see like one kid's watching on their laptop, the other's watching on their phone, the other has a tablet and I'm sitting here, you know, on my own computer, we're fragmenting the experience. Um, will there be a role for like the living room TV? And I was like, yeah, fundamentally, you know, people are still gonna wanna watch longer form content. And when you watch longer form content, there's both a social element to it in certain contexts, not in all contexts, but in certain contexts. And there's, you know, like, it's just a way better experience, especially if it's something visually stunning to watch on a really big screen than to sit there like, you know, neck hunched over your phone. Um, but yeah, you know, the optionality was a big part of what really drew me to Roku. Like I felt if they got to this future where there was, uh, where, where there was this convergence between CTV and TV. And if you look at their market share of all connected devices, and if they're able to maintain that market share where it's like, at the lowest end of ways that you could calculate it, it's like one in three people are connecting well, through Roku. One, one of the best deals that they did was, I mean, this, this, I'm speaking from a consumer perspective and full disclosure, I'm not a shareholder of Roku, but was when they did the deal with TCL. I mean, mm -hmm. that was brilliant. I mean, I, you know, my, my wife and I were, we, we disconnected from the, from cable. So we're like, okay, we want to get a smart TV. And when you're at, Co we went to Costco, you go to Costco, you look at all the TVs and you see TCL, it's the best deal. It's the same. It's just, it, they brought the people over from, I believe it was Samsung or, or, or one, one, maybe LG or some, one of the bigger names. And they basically created a, uh, a cheaper, but high quality TV that they have Roku in. 
I mean, I was never a Roku user before that. And after that, I was, I was hooked. It was so it made, it made so much sense to me. The big problem was, is that, you know, once all these different streaming services launch, you know, when Peacock launched and then the, the bot, I would call it a botch launch of the HBO max is that they didn't convert it fast enough. You know? So I think that's, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I since don't have my Roku right now, but, um, <laughs> but I mean, uh, it, at, at the time I was like, ah, if they only just converted that faster, you know, I would have been, I would have been on HBO max in a heartbeat. Right. Yeah. Well, so there are a few things to unpack there. I mean, like what started me on my trail of intrigue in Roku is I was looking to buy a TV and I was like, you know, similarly looking to cut the cord and I wanted to understand which my best, which were my best options. And I think like most people, you know, my hunt was like, okay, I should look at the Amazon TV. And when you Google reviews for the Amazon TV, you know, just about every one of them was comparing, um, you know, the not, and, I, and I'm not talking about the Fire TV stick or, or Puck. I'm talking about the actual uh, built-in Fire TV. When you start Googling reviews and you put it up against the Roku, oh my God, it's not even close. Like the quality of the TCL Roku was exponentially better in every review. And I was like, okay, I should look at the Roku and I should maybe, you know, because I might be interested in these companies, maybe just get both and test them side by side. And it's like, yeah, you could verify for yourself. It's not even close. The Roku TV is a way better experience. Um, and one of the interesting things, like a lot of people now talk about, okay, well, TCL's done really well on Roku. Does TCL have a right to ask for economics from Roku? And it's like, no, no, they don't. Because you know why? You didn't buy a TCL TV. You bought a Roku TV and the TCL specific TV within Roku's purview was the one with the best reviews. That's fine. That's good and well. But like, Roku could go help Hisense make as good a TV if they really wanted to pick another partner to kind of put out there. Um, and the customer is more beholden to the user experience, right? The interface and the UX on Roku is just way better than anything else out there to access smart TV. Um, it's, you know, I Bar you none. to measure it, the NPS in Roku is as high as just about any company up there. Um, and I think that's really important, right? It's like, you tell your friends, you see your friends, you know the experience. You could give a five-year-old a Roku remote or an 80-year-old a Roku remote, and each of them could figure it out just as quickly as the other. Um, good luck doing that with the Apple TV or the Fire Stick. Like, it's just not going to work. The five-year-old would be like, help me, help me. Um, and you'll get frustrated and you'll want something different, right? Um, so, you know, I think that's really important. I could go more in different directions, but I want to make sure I address the HBO Max and the Peacock point, right? Like, so that's one of the interesting things. Um, Roku as a distributor now has an important role to play and they are getting a little more courageous, um, a little more uh, bold and, and confident in asking content partners for a cut. And so, you know, obviously Netflix is one of the most watched uh, streaming services in the world. Um, Netflix doesn't have anything. And, you know, it's easy to say, I think from a customer's perspective, if you don't have Netflix on a, on a streaming distribution, you don't have streaming yeah. distribution at all. Um, but with some of these other partners, I think there's an important role for Roku to play. And I think they do a lot on behalf of their partners. And you could see that with Disney Plus's launch. Why was Disney Plus's launch a huge success and HBO Max and Peacock are like kind of afterthoughts? Well, Disney put a lot of effort behind it. And they engaged with Roku. They did every one of Roku's business lines that you could possibly do. They bought a button on the Roku remote. They paid for audience building. So they're paying for app installs and for content to appear on that right panel of the Roku screen when you turn on your TV. Um, and they paid for ads within uh, Roku TV shows so that they are hitting people everywhere. And they were willing to you know, play by the terms that Roku was willing to play because they knew that if they did this well, that you know, this, the results would speak for themselves. And sure enough, they have Disney's blown past any expectations. I should point out I'm a shareholder in Disney as well. So, you know, I've been pretty excited about that transformation. Now, I'm a shareholder in Comcast. And what I'm going to say about Peacock is not necessarily so kind. Um, uh, and HBO Max uh, definitely don't own at and I have no skin in the game there. Um, but I think when you look at HBO Max and you look at Peacock, those launches were not successful. And they have not met the, custom, the company's expectations. And I do think for what it's worth, I think Peacock and HBO Max have some interesting points and some interesting like 
um, it, like, like they both recognize the power of AVOD, right? And I think that's something pretty important. Peacock in particular really recognize that. That's part of the core thesis of Roku. AVOD is a really powerful platform. People don't just want SVOD. They don't want to just pay for everything. What Netflix got right wasn't about not having commercials. What they got right was about empowering a, a consumer to watch what they want when they wanted. Like that was, that was the real value prop. It wasn't no ads. Tasteful ads that are well-targeted, that are uh, you know, one fourth the ad load of linear TV, that's a powerful value prop. And I think Peacock recognized that and did it right. But what they didn't recognize, and I think with Peacock and HBO Max, you could point to why they had this problem. Both their parent companies, their primary business is distribution. They're not content companies. They weren't thinking about content first. Disney was. Disney is a content company. They're like, how do we get our content out there? Um, you know, Comcast and AT&T, uh, they're just not coming at it from the right angle. They've been on the wrong side of these battles with content companies in the past. You know, thinking about like, what do they get to ask Disney for carrying, um, you know, ESPN and these sorts of wars. And I think they took a pretty ass backwards approach. And I think it's really cost them. It's kind of slowed their achievement of their goals. And I think it's really been kind of, you know, it's not Roku who's lost out on that, even though some customers like myself, like I'd love to have HBO Max on Roku. You know, I think it'll happen sooner rather than later. Peacock relented. I think they did so um, for mutually beneficial terms. And I think Peacock's done a lot better since that happened. And I expect HBO Max to kind of follow pretty soon. Yeah. And you're starting to see, I mean, you're starting to see that they, I mean, not starting to, I mean, they had, they had to do a whole bunch of deals to bring all this content on their platform, just using HBO Max as them. They did the what hundred million dollar deal for, for South Park, the rights to that yeah. to get that on there, you know, friends. Uh, I think now on Peacock side, I think I just saw that the office is going to be exclusively on Peacock. Now, you know, they recognize that they need to make sure that the, this content, this high quality content with huge fan bases is on their platforms, you know? So it seems like they're starting to make the switch, but it's just, it's probably just that years of just where cable rules, you know, and now having to really look at themselves in the mirror and say, all right, we gotta, we gotta do, we gotta play, I guess yep. we gotta play ball here, but Hey, we'll do it. You know, and we realize, you know, one of the fundamental realities of the COVID situation for these companies is that, um, you know, call it half a decade of change happened overnight, right? So you suddenly go to an environment where like the uh, first and second quarter demand for Roku sticks for the hardware side of things was another Christmas, which is just absolutely insane, right? And then that happened again during the summer. And now we're in the holiday season and, you know, you'd kind of expect a uh, pretty similar, if not, you know, maybe, maybe some of that demand from Christmas was pulled forward, but still, you know, the amount of new uh, um, cord cutters that happened during this time period. And, you know, by the way, like whoever anticipated uh, a period of time where sports just weren't happening a slight digression, like I had made a meaningful investment in a sports betting company. And I was like, okay, one of the things I actually like about this company a lot, the companies can be, you know, shareholder and can be. Uh, one of the things I like about them a lot is perhaps even in a recession, they'll have more resilience, not just because, you know, people like the entertainment piece of things, but because states will want to legalize and regulate faster and you get a faster cadence of onboarding. And sure enough, the first recession that hits while I own it, you get no freaking sports at all. Um, <laughs> that was kind of a nutty experience. Um, we could talk about that later if you'd like. But to Definitely. tie it back to you know where, where we started, I mean, you have such rapid, drastic change. And I think people have a hard time like dealing with how, how the environment should look. Um, because right now, you know, what we were talking about end states evolving over periods of time, like you're moving towards the end state and it's going to happen, like it might be happening right now. And so like linear advertising budgets, like people shut those off. Those are right now going into social media and they're going into connected TV. Um, that means a lot for like all the content companies whose primary source of revenue is coming from or, or the channels, like having, having channels that sell ads. That's just not happening in this environment in the same way. And so when people think about where next year is going to be, I mean, I think the change is going to continue at this accelerated pace because this money is going to move around so quickly. Um, a lot of people won't even know what hit them. And so. Yeah, no, no, no finish your thought. I, I, yeah, the legacy players, like they really don't know how quickly they should be moving or not. Right. You, you know, do they want to cannibalize themselves or be cannibalized by the market? And I think you kind of see some of them 
uh, playing with, you know, one foot it, out the door. And I don't think that's viable when change is happening this fast. And I was really excited to see Disney kind of like, you know, make clear that they're going all in on the future. They're not like leaving, you know, there, there were some questions of whether they had one foot in the past, one foot in the future. And they kind of answered all questions unequivocally last oh, week. That, that investor day was really exciting. I listened to uh, full disclosure. I'm not a Disney shareholder, but I'm a Marvel. I, I, I was geeking. I just posted an episode <laughs> with Andrew Walker saying I'm geeking out on Marvel, but I listened to their whole, the whole uh, Kevin Feige part, the, the 21 minute. I was just, I was too excited, but, awesome. um, but, but yeah, but they're, I mean, you know, they're, they're really embracing the future, but you know, I have, I have one question to follow up on, on this idea of, uh, you know, with Roku and Amazon, Amazon and, and Apple TV, you know, this platform for distributing these various streaming networks. I mean, is the moat still pretty wide where these, these, these firms are so far ahead of the pack that it's, it's limiting maybe some of these, uh, maybe an upstart platform that's saying, Hey, look, no cut. We just want, you know, all the app infrastructure is now built. Put your apps on our on our platform now, and then you know we'll as we grow and grow, you know we'll have an option for a cut later. You know, is there is 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 the moat so wide now because of what we've seen this year, or is is there is there potential for disru- disruption? Yeah, I think the moat's pretty damn wide, and I think it's important because the value that Roku contributes to content creators content owners is immense. And I think people don't really appreciate that enough. Roku has spent uh, years building out an advertising infrastructure. They were the first to really have this thesis that AVOD would really play a meaningful role in connected TV. Um, And to build out that infrastructure involved um, not just building the actual tools to uh, deliver advertising, it was about building uh, data assets, right? So they have tons of data. Everyone who's on Roku has to give their payment credentials, which gives Roku uh, great visibility into uh, building a customer profile. And then the second side of that is from the beginning, they've worked with the measurement companies. Um, so Nielsen and Comscore to deliver like true measurement and attribution for advertisers. And so, you know, when you talk about like, could someone just create a platform and say like, okay, uh, you know, Peacock, go throw the office on here. Well, you know, good luck monetizing that if your thesis says Peacock is we need to sell ads. You know, a lot of that does have to come from the platform. And so I think Roku is able to deliver. If, if you look, there are really two platforms out there that could sell at really high CPMs and they offer different things. So Hulu and Roku are both like the two high CPM platforms in the uh, connected TV world. And what Hulu delivers, well, so what both have in common is they both have scale. They both have really large customer bases. Interestingly, I think Roku's taken, like when, when these conversations were emerging, their scale was roughly similar. Roku's kind of taken a pretty serious step ahead. So they both have scale. What Hulu has is what you'd call premium content. And historically in linear, like the better the content, the higher the CPM. What Roku has is predominantly a lot of their ad uh, placements are on longer tail content. Um, And so, you know, it's not exactly what you'd call premium content, but what they do have is they have all this data. So, you know, both have scale, but Roku's data could kind of capture some of the uh, premium that quality of content deserves. And so, you know, I think it's really hard for someone to build a competing platform because it's really hard to deliver ad. It's really hard to make sure that you have enough uh, uh, volume to deliver ads, um, you know, and, and not have too low a fill rate, right? That's really important. And you have to really make sure that you could do it um, with really little latency so that the experience of the viewer isn't interrupted. Um, and, you know, good luck as a platform trying to get someone to switch from Roku when they planted a TV on their wall in one room. Bless you, planted a TV on their wall in Thank the you. second room. You know, once you affix a TV on, on a wall, like that was a key insight for me and Roku because I built up my economics from when I purchased this company from like what's the value of their user base 
And I actually bought it for what their user base was worth. If you were able to understand like what their customer acquisition cost was, would look like and what their actual customer level margin was on how they were servicing them. And I think that's insane. Like you can't find stocks that cheap today. Um, so I knew exactly what I was bidding on and I knew exactly like what upside would contribute in an incremental way. Um, so, you know, I mean, obviously it's a very different proposition today. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the important parts. Like I, I, I don't see how you could convince someone to rip off, rip the TV off their living room wall um, and, and put on something different. Um, one of the interesting points that I'd add is like Roku has talked about how they could theoretically on the sticks, take their, um, uh, sell them for free, right? Go to a negative gross margin. Um, but they have done studies. They don't have to, they don't need to because they already priced as low or lower than anyone else out there. So like free wouldn't necessarily do anything better for them. And then there's this concept that um, in the book Influence by Cialdini, which is a fast, awesome book uh, called Commitment. And it's much like a Costco membership where when you actually put cold darn cash behind something, even if it's not a big amount, you kind of commit to that platform. And I think that's what's happened with a lot of people behind Roku. Um, once, once you as a customer put your money behind it, once you have the experience and you love it, um, you're just not going to change. I think, I, I think the barrier to change is really high. So, you know, it might be appealing from a, from a content company's perspective to maybe have someone chisel their way in, but from a customer's perspective, good luck. Oh, dude. And I'll, I'll be the first one flying that flag because uh, I, I'm right now, I went from my Roku TV where I'm, I'm back to using a, uh, the, the, a very old Apple TV version. And I'm just like, we're, my wife and I were just so annoyed. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so annoyed. But to wrap the bow on the Roku conversation, if you had to compare it to a New York sports team, you know, where would you say it is in, in the, amongst its competition? Oh man. Well, so instead of picking a team, I'd pick a moment in history. Oh, okay. And it's like, All right. I like this, you know, the 1969 Mets. So obviously it's not history that I lived and experienced, but you know, the Mets were, and maybe you could say the same about the 1980 Islanders. Right. Um, and what both had in common is their first years in the league. They were literally the most pathetic franchises you could conceive. They had, you know, they each set records for how horrible they were as organizations. So maybe that's too harsh to Roku because Roku did start out as something like pretty special, but they were kind of like Roku was conceived within Netflix and the day they were supposed to launch Netflix killed it. Um, so that's where I want to establish the comparison in that sense. But, <laughs> you know, so, so I, you know, I don't want to say that Roku started as, as, as a heaping pile like the Mets and Islanders did, but they were a great idea. They had a great identity. Um, and they both came from like, you know, there was some progeny there. Like the Mets were the heir apparent to the Dodgers, right? And people bled Dodger blue. Um, and to be able to take that mantle and like carry the blood and the DNA, right? There's, there's the DNA of Netflix infused in Roku, which I think is important and interesting and could go to interesting places down the line. Um, but to kind of like tie the loose edges, um, within a few years, they were world champions, right? Um, so the start was hard. It wasn't easy. You didn't see that there was a platform there, um, but there was. And, uh, you know, it went very far, very fast. And I never expected something like this with Roku, but that's where we are, right? Um, yep. It's yep. a pretty special place. For sure. All right. So quick transition, you know, you mentioned your, your sports betting uh, situation this year. You know, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear that story a little bit. That's, that sounded, sounds like it was pretty interesting. Sure. Yeah. Camby has been a really interesting position for me in a lot of ways. Um, it's taught me a lot about myself, but it's also been a great learning experience on like truly understanding an environment, understanding a complex ecosystem, um, understanding a company whose investor base wasn't exactly familiar with where the growth opportunity was coming from because they're a Swedish listed, but predominantly U.S. opportunity uh, or, or really incremental opportunity was happening in the U.S., Right. And so I first got involved with Canby in the summer of 2018 when rumors emerged that uh, DraftKings might consider leaving the Canby platform. Um, I'd been doing my work in advance of that. I'd get, been getting familiar with the lay of the land. I was fascinated by Canby because they were taking like a B2B approach to the sports betting industry and they were contributing like really interesting value um, to 
their partners. And I felt that in the US, that value prop was even more compelling. So Cambi's value prop is they are able to, um, you know, do turnkey uh, line management, odds management and creation, uh, do that on, um, you know, in play and all the stuff that we as US bettors have been familiar with. So futures markets, pregame, um, halftime, all these kinds of uh, special lines. And they're able to, they, they have integrated risk management. So they manage risk for uh, the front end operators so that the front end operators don't blow up, right? And so that they have an understanding of what they're doing. And so in the industry, you know, a lot of people kind of approach it as like, oh, well, maybe you could just scrape lines and borrow lines from like, you know, I could go to any site and see what the lines are and I could manage that. But, you know, when you're an operator, you can't actually do that because you don't know where your risk lies. And so you have to manage risk alongside the lines and you have to have an interplay between the two. Um, There's a great line I got exposed to from a former Cambi employee, which was if you don't have integrity over your lines, you don't have integrity over risk management. And at the end of the day, right, as investors, we could really appreciate risk management is like first and foremost, you know, the most important thing, right? You don't want to blow up by having a sports book, uh, have, have the wrong kind of exposure. Um, so Cambi's value prop, like in the U.S., um, there's the Wire Act um, and, you know, betting is being legalized after PASPA. It's being legalized and regulated on a state by state basis. By the way, I'm going back in my head. I actually started with Cambi in the summer of 2019, not 2018. So I just want to correct that. Um, but, you know, it, it was being legalized and regulated, um, you know, across various uh, states at a different cadence. And you needed uh, market access one way or another in states. So in some states like New Jersey, market access is wide open. But then, um, you know, you get other states uh, like where Connecticut might go, where like the tribes that are here are going to have exclusive rights. So not anyone could just go in there. Um, and then in some states, you have like this in-between state like Pennsylvania, where you could sell one or two skins so long as you have a land-based nexus. So like for DraftKings to be able to you know, serve their product in that state, they have to have access to uh, someone who has a land-based right to do this, to kind of like sell them access in exchange for a royalty. Um, so really balkanized regulatory regime. The Wire Act, you can't move money across state lines. So, you know, let's say the uh, Patriots are playing the Eagles and you have like really heavy vo betting volume on the Pats in um, New England uh, and you have really heavy betting volume on the Eagles in um, Pennsylvania. In theory, you'd want to pair off those exposures, um, but you can't because of the Wire Act, like move the money to kind of cross those exposures. So unless you have a betting nexus in both states, it's quite complex. Canby could, by virtue of how they're situated and how they're operated, while they have to have, because of the Wire Act, a server in every state, they could offset these exposures in ways that other players couldn't. And they could get scale in ways that other players couldn't by having access and partners in various states that give them a lot more insight into where lines should be, what risk should look like, risk management should look like. Um, and it's a really compelling offering. So, you know, DraftKings is maybe going to leave them. They're set to leave them by the end of 2021, but they brought on Penn Gaming and Barstool. The entire platform yeah. is being built on it. And so, you know, one of the beauties of Barstool, I mean, say what you will about them. Um, I think from a betting perspective, they have a unique advantage, right? So the job of a front end is to acquire customers. Dave Portnoy is a customer acquisition machine and people are going to want to bet on that platform by virtue of, you know, their affinity for Barstool and they have a really like passionate fan base. And the other thing that's interesting about them. So like one of the challenges for a front end, great. You acquired a customer. How do you keep a customer? In the industry, you could look at like UK or Australia, the average customer stays on for about two and a half years. Average customer uses about four different platforms, but shit, Barstool customers are loyal. And when Barstool customers lose, they're not going to be like, well, this platform's unlucky. I'm going to uh, FanDuel. They're going to be like, well, the refs suck. The weather was bad. They're going to blame everyone but <laughs> Dave Portnoy. And so they're going to stick with the platform. And that's really powerful. And I think, you know, Penn is committed. Well, they have that media, they have that, they have that media component too. So, you know, you're not just, mm -hmm. you're not just using the platform to bet. You're also like, all right, well, all right. Even if I lost, at least I can get a couple laughs on something funny that they just did. Damn right. And that's pretty powerful, you know? And yeah. so I think they have great partners in the U S even beyond DraftKings. 
Um, I, and, and I think, you know, they have a really long runway to taking a lot of share here. And meanwhile, like, you know, when you speak from a guard perspective, like I effectively, when I bought the stock, I, I was very confident that what I was buying was their relatively mature, but still growing European business. And the U S business was entirely free. Like anything that happened here was pretty much free. And if they got to 15% share, uh, of U.S. volumes, that it would be a total home run. And, you know, I think all signs are that they very much should get there. Now, I did not anticipate within a, you know, a year and a half of owning this thing that we'd end up in an environment where all sports shut for a long period of time. Um, that kind of sucked, but they did, you know, they had a really well capitalized balance sheet. They didn't even have to tap a line of credit to kind of withstand that time period. They put a lot of effort into their product development at the time, and they were like totally ready for the uh, sports to come back. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the things I did believe in was that when a recession hit, states would get more keen on legalizing and regulating sports betting. And sure enough, that's playing out exactly as I would have hoped. Um, you're seeing New York move a lot closer in my state of Connecticut. We knew it was an inevitability here because we're kind of broke. Um, but, you know, ev everyone knew we needed to kind of tap into that revenue pool. But you end up in these petty fights, like should the tribes get the exclusive right or should we be open like Jersey? And so you punt for two years, but now you can't punt anymore. So it's it's going to happen. Um, and I do think, you know, like Americans like sports betting. I think it's an interesting thing. Um, you could debate whether it's a, a endeavor of skill or one of uh, entertainment and, you know, where, where there's some sort of social responsibility to kind of limit how much people could lose. And you see there's regulation in the UK that's going that direction. I do think that's inevitable. I think that's good, you know, but I, th I think the, the sports betting opportunity is a really interesting one. One I expect to, you know, I, I expect to hold shares of Canby for a long time. Very cool. All right. So I, I want to now transition to uh, uh, actually your most recent uh, quarterly letter that, and something stood out to me that I wanted to ask you, you know, you, you talk in there about this idea of the point of ignition, you know, when something goes from a compelling idea to an actual investment, love to, to, to what do you mean here? And, and love to get your, your full thoughts on this concept and idea. Yeah. So in the letter, I wrote about how like company build, building and investing are a lot like building a campfire where, you know, you can't just take a big log and light it. You have to start with the kindling, build it up, get enough heat that the fire could actually ignite and become self-sustaining. And, you know, when, when we're investing, what we're doing is we're like turning over a lot of rocks. We're searching the world. We're trying to find interesting ideas. And we're building a file on ideas and we're like trying to get a true understanding of whether it checks our criterion, right? I have a checklist. I want to make sure it, it kind of like meets what I'm looking for. But even then, it's not necessarily something that I'm going to put capital behind. And I think one of the one of the elements for me about it all is is like, um, do I truly understand the decision a customer is making when they engage with the with the business, right? And then the other one, one of the other things that I talked about in the letter, I think when maybe I talked about, I, I feel like I did um, when there's certain ideas where like, they just kind of like hang around is interesting. And you can't like, they're kind of like that pesky fly. You can't like shoo them off. They keep like coming at you. You keep coming back to it in various ways and it keeps like hitting you. And it's like, it hasn't gone away yet. And it's like still really interesting. Um, and you know, you have this idea, you have this like framework for how you think it can and should work as an investment, but you know, you're not quite ready to commit capital behind it. But well, you know, there's this certain point, there's this ignition point where you know it in your head, where you know it in your body, where you like just feel and see that like I can't help it anymore. I have to, you know, move my chips in and uh, make my play. And and you know, I think that's a powerful, powerful spot. Um, it's something that I really think like early on, I didn't have a good framework and I didn't have like a good level of intuition built around it for a long time. But I think like increasingly I could reason by analogy. I could say like this experience is similar to this. And some of those analogies were actually my experiences, but some of those other analogies are like, I've now studied so many more industries. I've studied the history of so many industries, um, you know, and I, I have frameworks that I could rely on to kind of like get me over the hump. Um, so I think that's a lot of what it means to me, but I think for everyone, it means something a little different. Um, some people Absolutely. are a little more interested, a little more willing to do it. And I think one other point of context that I'd, I'd add is that I've had this like target of roughly 20% turnover. 
And, you know, I, I, I used to speak of it as an actual like ceiling more so than a target on how much turnover I'd have in a year, but I now view it more as a framework. And what that framework means to me are two, two things. Um, one, you know, 20% turnover means you're on average expecting to hold a position for five years, right? So I've lived that, uh, my average position is actually, you know, uh, live proving that out, um, at the very least, maybe, uh, maybe that's on the low end, but the other is that, you know, if, if you have a central tendency toward 25 positions, it really only means you need five good ideas a year. And so this point of ignition, right? Like I'm really only looking for a handful of ideas in a year. So an idea really has to be special and it really has to grab me in to get me to actually go over the hump. Like I'm not looking for a lot of ideas. Uh, my, my propensity is toward inaction. So to get me from inaction to action, it, 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 it takes something like meaningful. And that's Very that's good. what it what it gets at for me. Look, in the interest of full transparency, I only I really wanted to ask this question to set up a remix to ignition joke, but uh, <laughs> but I can't think of anything really clever. So at, at, at least at least we got a really cool analogy and something that I think everybody can take from that. So that that net positive. Uh, there you so, go. <laughs> Glad I could help. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. All right, man. Well. This is my favorite question to ask. You give you actually given a lot of anecdotes during this interview today, and I'm really really appreciative of it. And so, but but my favorite question to ask every every guest that I have on here is, what would you say is an investing experience that really impacted you the most? You know, um, it could be any investing experience. It could be, you know, just or even a recent one. You know, what what what's something that has really impacted how you currently you know look at a potential new investment or your your framework? Yeah. So. Um, the experience that is truly impactful on me and I could trace to specific actions in the future was um, all the work I had done on Shopify um, in late 2015 and early 2016. And I never actually bought a single share. And I never bought a single share because when I was working on Shopify, every which way I built up uh, my numbers on the company, I was way ahead of the street. And I was like, I have to be stupid. I'm a fool. Like, what am I thinking? What am I seeing? Like, how could I take these numbers down? And, and you know, I felt I was building up the model, the revenue KPIs in the right way. And I felt I was triangulating it in the right way from every piece of information I could pull into my mosaic. And, you know, no matter what, I was like, this is just so wrong. Like I'm, I'm an idiot. Like, and I was critiquing myself because, you know, and in my process, I work up my numbers before I look at the street, but then I want to have a sense of where other people are situated, where the consensus is situated. And um, so, you know, I passed on Shopify. It turns out that my crazy numbers were way too low. They destroyed them in actuality. Um, you know, I passed on it because I felt I didn't understand the business, not because I felt it was cheap, I felt my understanding had to be wrong. And I realized it was actually my understanding that was just totally right. And that gave me a kind of confidence that I didn't have heading into that period. Like I was really kind of, you know, developing myself as an investor. And so like it lent itself to me doubting myself at the time. And that switch flipped. And I could tell you the exact same situation happened again with Roku when I was working up my numbers heading into 2018. And I was like, you know, the street is way below me. And I really had confidence in how I was working it up myself. And I was like, you know, why it was impactful on me was because not only was I able to say like, well, shit, um, you know, this looks just like Roku, uh, just like Shopify. So like I have an analogy I could reason from here. Um, and so, you know, I'm probably not wrong. Like I trust my analysis. My process is good. I'm coming at this from the right angle. There was a second step to it, which was, like, well, if I know I'm right and I know uh, they're wrong, I'm going to take that much bigger a swing because I know this idea is going to really work if I truly am right. And so it was one of the bigger swings I've taken. And, uh, you know, I think it's defined me as an investor. And that would have never happened had it not been for Shopify. So, you know, while I miss Shopify, I call it my greatest act of omission ever. I think, uh, you know, I made my best investment ever because of it, too. Um, 
I think that I think that's a great place to end it today. So with that, Elliot, where can my audience go and find everything they need to know to follow you? Listen to your you also you also are a host uh, on on another show with John Mihail uh, John Mihaljevic and Phil I, I up these, this I, week in intelligent investing. Come check it out. I think we have a really good go. podcast. It's it's uncut. Just. You know, John, I apologize. Week, a, yeah, no worries, no worries. Yeah, it's not an easy one. Um, just I, I, like everyone spells my Euro- name with two T's these, sometimes. Look, these European um, last names today. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mumble mouth this morning. Exactly, so. it's <laughs> like you with hockey names, right? Uh, yeah. same, same story. Um, it's good so stuff. yeah, you can find me on Twitter as well, Elliot Turn. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty active there, talking about. You know, I, I really like engaging with people who like force me to sharpen my own ideas. So if you, if you ever feel an angle on that, you know, feel free. And uh, so the podcast, Twitter, those, those are the two best ways. Very cool. All right. Well, Hey, listen, you're always welcome back on or on the investors round table to a sharpen those edges. All right. So uh, thank you so much, Bobby. Absolutely. Elliot, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Good luck. Stay safe. And I look forward to our next chat. Awesome. Take care. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Podcast.